just a moment ago. Some people identified only as Greeks approached Philip and asked to see Jesus. That request eventually led Jesus to say that his hour had come. The hour had come for him to be glorified. The hour had come for what would be a dramatic showdown between the power of divine love and life and the system of domination, exclusion, greed, privilege, violence, and death represented by religious elites, commercial greed, and the imperial domination of the Roman Empire. The teaching of Jesus about that showdown was triggered by a request from Gentiles, from people who were considered outsiders by the religious elites who ruled the life of the people from the Jerusalem temple. It is important for us to understand that passage from this context. Jesus had recently raised Lazarus from the dead and restored him to his family. Jesus had been a guest in the home of Lazarus and Martha and Mary in Bethany. We read that in the first part of the 12th chapter of John. His ministry of teaching and healing and embracing people from all walks of life as equals which had been known before Lazarus was raised, became known to even more people as the annual Passover festival in Jerusalem approached. And we read that from verses 9 through 18 in the, verse, the 12th chapter of John. Not in the passage we've read is that Jesus has already entered Jerusalem in what we call the Palm Sunday processional. At, he's in Jerusalem as, at the head of chanting festival pilgrims, and his religious critics had realized at that point that their whole campaign to discredit him as a religious fraud had failed. So the requests from these Greeks, these Gentiles, who were in Jerusalem for the Passover festival, to see Jesus, shows that his message of divine love had gone beyond the traditional notion of religious life. You understand, the festival was thought of as a Jewish festival. And here we had these Greeks, these Gentiles here. And they wanted to see Jesus the gospel of divine love and kinship with all humanity had become a first century version of viral. It had gone viral. And this is the context for what Jesus was about to proclaim about discipleship in the passage we consider today. As we read it and reflect on it, we're forced to ask ourselves, do we really understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Is it simply a matter of believing certain things about Jesus and God? Or is it more than that? When we think and speak about following Jesus, uh, we must not ignore what Jesus said about his life in God. We must not overlook that life in obedience to God's love meant for Jesus something a whole lot more than believing in God. If we want to understand what it means to follow Jesus in that life, we have to pay attention to a whole lot more than what we traditionally think in terms of personal salvation. If you just believe, then that's all. We must pay attention to what Jesus said about what and where following him will take us and what it will make of us and what and where following God's love took Jesus and what it made of Jesus. 
I say that because many people believe that the gospel of Jesus is primarily about personal salvation from sin and divine judgment. That's okay as far as it goes. But the fourth gospel proclaims from start to finish that the ministry of Jesus involved a whole lot more than that. What the gospel name for John shows us is that in Jesus, God was engaging the whole system. We say the word world, but that word world means system. We talk about the system. The system did this and the system did that. But we don't realize that when we read the New Testament gospel of Jesus, we're talking about God engaging the system, challenging the system, a system of domination, of exclusion, of greed, of privilege, of violence, of death. By the time of the events mentioned in this passage occurred, there is a sharp difference has been shown between the ministry of Jesus and this whole system of domination and greed and exclusion and privilege and violence and death. And in John's gospel, we learn that the system includes religion. Hello? It includes religious institutions. It includes religious practices. We see that represented by the elites who claim the authority to define life from the Jerusalem temple based on notions of ethnic and male privilege. If you were Jewish, you were in an insider. You were, you were part of the chosen community. But if you were not, if you were these Greeks, you could only go so far into the temple. You could only get so close. They didn't have that childhood with Jesus. Jesus wasn't kept from them. The love of God brings people who have historically been viewed as outsiders up close. And so in the ministry of Jesus, we see God's love challenging the system that includes the system of religious elitism. Mm. The religious elitism of that time also includes male privilege. You understand only men could get into the temple close up. Mm. We learn the system includes not only ethnic privilege and male privilege, but also national power. We see in the New Testament and in the climaxing times of the Gospels, the growing tension between the ministry of Jesus and the force of empire, represented by the Roman Empire. And at Calvary, we see that most clearly. We learn from the New Testament Gospels what we hear people say today. It seems the system controls everything. It controls the money. It controls the religious life. It controls the use of power. Nowhere, no matter where you turn, it seems like you're running into the system. During the time of Jesus, the system included the Roman Empire that dominated the world by the threat of violence, backed up by military force. Access to healing was controlled by the system of wealth and privilege. Oh, 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 excuse me. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? When we remember these realities, we can better understand the meaning of Jesus' ministry and his life and his death and his resurrection. And what we understand when we think of the ministry of Jesus in these closing passages before his crucifixion is that Jesus represents much more than God coming into the world to save individuals, as important as, that, as may be. Jesus represents God taking on the whole system of domination and exclusion, and greed, and privilege, and violence, and death. 
When Jesus said that his hour had come, he was trying to help his first followers understand it was time for the showdown between the power of divine love and the system of domination and exclusion and greed and privilege and violence and death that threatens everything about how people live together, how we relate to one another, and how we relate to and live with God. This is about more than private salvation. It's about God saving all of us and everything from the system that is built and thrives on domination and exclusion and greed and privilege and violence and death. And according to Jesus, that showdown, that showdown between God's love and life and the system required him to let go of his concerns about self-preservation. I know we say self-preservation is the first law of nature, but Jesus says the hour has come it's showdown time. It's showdown time. It's time for the Son to be glorified, but this is not glorified by a parade. It's glorified by a passion. By a passion that involves offering oneself up, not as a victim, but as a challenger to the system. Jesus does not offer himself up as a victim of the system. He offers himself up as a challenger of that system, and he used the metaphor of a grain of wheat germinating to become much fruit to show us that taking on the system means we must be willing to follow God in loving something much more than ourselves. You understand, God could be God without giving up Jesus. God didn't have to give up Jesus in order to be God. You, you get that? God did not need to give up Jesus to be God. God gave up Jesus to get us. And the lesson that we learn from the life of Jesus is that the system cannot be challenged and overcome by imitating the system. You can't save the system by copying the system. Jesus shows us that humanity and the creation are not saved by the system of domination and exclusion and greed and privilege and violence and death. Humanity and the creation cannot be redeemed from the system even by religious versions of the system. I say that, I say that, I say it because if we're not careful, we will embrace the notion that religion has on the system. The Crusades was a religious version of the system of domination. You understand that? The whole Crusades movement was a, was a religious version of the Roman Empire. And so it's like you took the Roman Empire, dipped it in the flag of Jesus, or put the flag of Jesus in front of it, and said, we're going to save the world by killing you. <laughs> if you don't confess, we'll kill you. We'll conquer you, and we'll save the world. The religious system of conquest is not a religious system of salvation. That's not why God sent Jesus in the world. Jesus calls us to follow him in the showdown by not not by being another version of the Roman Empire, but by being something very, very different. Jesus also shows us that humanity and the creation are not saved by a commercial version of the empire. You can't Walmart yourself into salvation. Hello? You can't Wall Street yourself into salvation. The system constantly tells people to work harder so we can buy more and then to use our wealth as a weapon against others who are less fortunate. In other words, the more you work, the more you'll make, 
and the more you make, the more you have, and the more you have, the more you can use what you have to keep other people who don't make as much as you have from being off as well off as you are. That's the system of Walmart and Wall Street. And Jesus shows us that God's love is not built on the system of commercial greed. He calls us to follow him in a showdown with that version of the system. And Jesus also calls us to follow him in the showdown with what New Testament theologian Walter Wink has called the myth of redemptive violence. Remember that, the myth of of redemptive violence. What are you talking about, preacher? According to this myth, the way to bring order out of chaos is by violently dominating and eliminating those who we consider our enemies. When Jesus said that the hour had come for him to be glorified, he was foretelling the violence of his impending arrest on trumped up charges. And all the other expressions of violence he would suffer at the hands of agents of religious and commercial and political empire that came together, that conspired together, religion and commerce and politics came together to oppose the force of the love of God and lead to his, his cruci crucifixion and death. That myth of redemptive violence that Walter Wink talks about is all around us today. I didn't realize, and I was reading Walter Wink, that we grew up on it. We grew up with it. And it was part of how we were nursed. How many of you watched cartoons growing up? Do you recall a cartoon involving Papa? The sailor man. Oh, yeah, you do. You do. You do. All right. The myth of redemptive violence. You remember the line in Popeye? Popeye and sailor. Popeye and Bluto. In Popeye, Bluto always threatens to assault olive oil. And it's really, we're laughing about it, but really what we saw in Popeye was a cartoonish version of misogyny, male aggression against women. Every day we watched Popeye and watched Bluto, we were watching a cartoon man attack, manhandle, and threaten to rape a cartoon woman who was always portrayed as helpless and a victim. And then, then there was Popeye. Popeye the sailor. And Bluto whipped up on Popeye and would beat up Popeye until sometime in the cartoon, you recall, out of Popeye's pocket would pop what? A can of spinach. And you recall how, what, ha what would happen? Papa would take in his spinach. He would get strength from his spinach. And what would he do with that strength? He then would whip Bluto. The violence of Bluto attacking the woman and the man only being defeated by the violence of Papa. And you recall how they would always end the cartoon? Popeye singing, I'm strong to the finish because I eat my spinach. I'm... <laughs> we did not realize it, but we were watching the myth of redemptive violence. The only way we can stop mean, hateful, violent 
people is by being more violent. The only way we can stop people with whom we disagree is by being violent. And we watched it as children. Popeye the sailor is no longer being watched, but we still remember Popeye. We now have video games that are violent. And the video games we watch do not talk to us about how we will become better, more just, more loving people by means that are peaceful and loving. They teach us that the way we save ourselves is by being better able at killing one another. This whole struggle, this whole argument we're having nowadays in this culture about how to protect children in schools, not just children, our society from gun violence is not about how, to, about how to get rid of the instruments of violence, but how to put more violent means in the hands of people who would not otherwise be violent so they can be instruments of violence. Hey, if we just give teachers another version of Popeye's spinach, we'll then have teachers who can be like Papa and will save our olive oil children from the Bluto forces of our town. We, we have this myth of redemptive violence and in the face of that myth, we have the gospel of Jesus. <laughs> who says, my hour has come. It's time for a showdown. But the showdown is not between a version of Papa. It's a showdown that takes violence on and exposes it as evil and wrong. Violence does not save us, no matter who wills it. Jesus did not say, blessed are the peacemakers, and then tell us to pick up bigger clubs, sticks, rocks to throw at each other. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, and then went to Calvary. Mm. And then Jesus says to us, those who love their life lose it. Ah, there is some strange, strange stuff going on here. Jesus is saying, wait a minute. You cannot save your life by trying to take other life and say that you're saving your life. Because when you take other life, you're actually losing more of the life you're trying to save as well as losing the life of the person that you're taking away. There's something deadly about the myth of violence. There's something life-taking about it. Jesus tells you and me, hey, those who would hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What are you saying, Jesus? Jesus is saying, look, this world tells you to be, treat everybody else as your possible enemy and to treat every threat to your life as a reason to be threatening. I am showing you a better way. The way of God, and that's what Jesus represents. Jesus represents God. Suffering violence. Let me say it again. Jesus represents God with us. Suffering violence. 
We do not understand Calvary correctly if we only think of Calvary being the price God paid for our personal sins. Calvary really represents the price God pays to show us how much sin infests our whole system. It's not just me and me and me, oh Lord, standing in prayer. Our whole system is jacked up. The religion is jacked up. The marketplace is jacked up. The politics is jacked up. And in Calvary, Jesus takes on the whole system. But he doesn't take it on with a first century version of tanks and aircraft carriers. He takes it on in the presence of God's love and life and says, those Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains forever, a single grain. Well, is that an easy thing to contemplate? No, it wasn't needed for Jesus. Notice what Jesus said. Now my soul is troubled. This was serious stuff for Jesus. This is sobering stuff for Jesus. It's sobering stuff for us. But that does not mean that we stop from embracing it. Jesus did not stop from embracing Calvary just because he recognized the violence in the world. Rather, he said, Father, glorify your son, your name, and the voice comes, I've glorified it. The message there is uh, God affirms us, but every time God affirms us, other people don't always understand what God's doing with us. Some folks thought it was thunder. <laughs> don't be surprised when people don't understand what God's doing with you. God sometimes speaks with you and other folks around you think it's thundering. Hello? <laughs> it's a weather issue. <laughs> it's just environmental factors. They're just off. <laughs> no. And Jesus says, no, it wasn't, that wasn't for me. <laughs> that was for you. That's for you. When I'm lifted up, meaning the way he was going to die, then I'll draw, remember this, all people to myself. Remember that, all people to myself. We talk about salvation, and we need to remember it's not about personal salvation, it's about all people. God sent Jesus for all people to save all people from the system. And if we follow Jesus, Jesus calls us to follow him in loving God so much that we're willing to live and even die to show God's love for all people. Amen.
numbers of bulbs. We affirm every Sunday that the offering is the invitation, and the invitation is the offering because, as I like to tell us, God doesn't ask us to give anything before we give ourselves. We give ourselves first because that is the most we are. That is all we are. We are a whole lot more than our stuff. However much stuff or how much how much we like our little stuff. We're worth a whole lot more to God than stuff. And so giving ourselves to God is the first and highest offering we can do. Giving ourselves to God is why Jesus came to make God close to us. So we could see that we could trust God with ourselves. Give yourself to God, and then in the offering we give, however much, whatever it may be, is a symbol of the self you've already given. And if you have little, your little is not little in any man but your own. It is only little to us. It's like we are gods. Because we're God's, everything we are is precious. Would you come, those who receive the offer, do so this way. Thank you. 